And so in our previous parts, we discussed the many, many things wrong with Danny's backstory, and based on limited information, we tried to put forward a narrative that made more sense. For example, it makes more sense that Danny is called Stormborn from Stannis' storming of Dragonstone, rather than to believe a once-in-a-century storm occurred during her birth. It makes more sense that Danny is a local child from Dragonstone, rather than a contrived, just-at-the-right-moment, super-special incest baby born from an aging woman riddled with fertility issues. It makes more sense that the house with the red door with its lemon tree was actually in a location where lemon trees could grow, and it makes more sense that Willem Derry, rather than having contradictory characteristics, is actually a conflation of more than one person in a young girl's mind. And based on Viserys' education in history and religion, it stands to reason that he was surrounded by educators in history and religion, namely a maester and a septon, as hinted at with Danny's memories of an old man with soft hands and of exotic scented oils. Now, accepting that Viserys Targaryen was surrounded by a man-at-arms, a maester, and a septon, we must draw parallels to the other Targaryen cause, that of Aegon, a man surrounded by a man-at-arms, duck, a maester, held in half-maester, and a septa, septa Lamor. And the Aegon cause is a cause that appears to have popped up suspiciously around the time that the Viserys cause was shut down. That is, when Viserys and Danny were ejected from the house with the red door, John Connington was being pulled in to foster Aegon. So what on earth was going on with the two Targaryen causes, and how did they relate to each other? Well, it's tough to say, but this is what we can piece together. So, we know that John Connington was pulled into the Aegon cause 12 years before the events of A Dance with Dragons, and we know that John Con joins the Golden Company for five years, sometime after his failure at the Battle of the Bells, during Robert's Rebellion, and his exile, which occurred in 283. And yes, we have some uncertainty with the timing of events during Robert's Rebellion, and the travel times to get to Essos, and rounding in people's descriptions of time passing, but considering all of this, Late 288 or early 289 appears to be when John Con is recruited to take care of a seven-year-old Aegon. And this appears to be around when Viserys and Danny were expelled from the house with the red door, if not slightly before. Danny was born in the middle of 284 and has dim memories of the house with the red door. People tend to have their first memories around four or five. So yes, late 288, early 289, we're in the same ballpark. Whether Aegon's cause was put together right before Viserys' cause fell apart or right after, we're looking at these events happening within months of each other. Two Targaryen boys being groomed in Essos to take the throne at a later date. It's a coincidence that is too hard to ignore. So Jon Khan tells us in his inner monologue that he was recruited by Varys and Illyrio back in 288 or 289, so we know that Varys and Illyrio were scheming at least that far back. And we also know that Varys was well aware of Viserys' location and activities for Viserys' entire exile. Barristan specifically tells us that Varys would regularly report on Viserys' status to Robert. This means that Varys and Illyrio were actively watching one Targaryen cause closely while setting up and supporting a different Targaryen cause. But here's the thing with the two causes. For Aegon's cause to succeed, Viserys' cause must ultimately fail. After all, there cannot be two kings. Viserys was declared heir by Ares, meaning Aegon was disinherited. Viserys has a claim, a very good claim. Yes, one can argue whether it's a better or worse claim than Aegon's claim, as he's a mysteriously back-from-the-dead supposed son of Rhaegar, the former heir, but that would still be an argument, meaning there would be division among potential supporters. When it comes down to it, Viserys is a major problem for Varys and Illyrio. In fact, even Danny by herself would be a problem as the heir of Viserys, versus a boy with a questionable identity, though that problem at least could be fixed through a marriage. So the big question is, how could Varys and Illyrio support two conflicting causes? Well, the most obvious answer is, they didn't. It may be that Varys and Illyrio somehow sabotaged the Viserys cause to make way for the Aegon cause. After all, Team Viserys appeared to be on the verge of securing the Dornish and Tyrashi in 289, and John Connington sees Dorn as central to the success of the Aegon cause. At least, the Aegon cause without dragons. 
Perhaps Varys and Illyrio poisoned people at the House with the Red Door, making things seem like a wasting sickness. Or perhaps they orchestrated division among Viserys' loyal men. Or perhaps those hired knives were not Robert's, but Varys and Illyrio's. Perhaps. Though one wonders why Viserys and Danny were simply not killed. It's hard to believe that Varys would have failed at killing Viserys over and over and over again. Botching one or two assassination attempts is one thing, but multiple over the course of maybe eight years? Not really possible. Not to mention, eventually Viserys and Danny fall right into Varys and Illyrio's hands and stay with Illyrio at his manse for six months. If the cheesemonger and the spider wanted Viserys and Danny dead, they'd be dead. So what did Varys and Illyrio want with a living Viserys and a living Danny? Clear barriers to the Aegon cause and rivals for the Iron Throne. Well, it's of course very, very suspicious that Danny was given dragon eggs by Illyrio. Danny secretly has the ability to hatch eggs and just so happens to receive insanely expensive dragon eggs as gifts. This from a man who praises Danny's purple eyes and her blood from old Valyria. And we the readers are meant to find this suspicious. Viserys' ghost specifically asks us to wonder about why she was given the eggs. Let's remember that the eggs are so valuable that they could have bought Viserys his army in the first place, calling into question the entire purpose of the Dothraki marriage and Danny and Viserys' trip into the Dothraki Sea. And we should never forget that Jorah Mormont, Illyrio's creature, went out of his way to keep Viserys from taking the eggs and, at a critical moment, failed to inform Viserys that Danny wanted him to have them. No, in retrospect, it seems that Danny and her eggs were central to Illyrio's plans. That is, based on Danny's looks, the shade of her eye color or something, Varys and Illyrio figured out that Danny could in fact hatch dragon eggs. But do we have any evidence that Varys or Illyrio knew that Danny was special? What exactly do we know about their scheming? Well, when Tyrion meets Illyrio, Tyrion specifically asks about Illyrio's motives and plans. Unfortunately, what we get is a very perplexing story. Why should a Magister of Pentos give three figs who wears the crown in Westeros? Where is the gain for you in this venture, my lord? The fat man dabbed grease from his lips. I'm an old man, grown weary of this world and its treacheries. Is it so strange that I should do some good before my days are done, to help a sweet young girl regain her birthright? Next you'll be offering me a suit of magic armor and a palace in Valyria. If Daenerys is no more than a sweet young girl, the Iron Throne will cut her into sweet young pieces. Fear not, my little friend. The blood of Aegon the Dragon flows in her veins. Now, Illyrio's story is filled with lies, and Tyrion knows not to trust much of it. Still, we get an interesting initial claim, that Illyrio's motives are about birthright. Now, this is a very weird claim, as Danny is only queen if we accept that Viserys was the heir and not Aegon, Illyrio's actual choice. And even accepting that Viserys was the heir, we have to ignore the decision of the Great Council of 101, which places Targaryen males before Targaryen females. It is a clear lie that Illyrio values Daenerys' birthright when his Aegon support is the fact of the matter. However, it may be true that Illyrio does value birthright if you believe that Aegon is a Blackfire or from some other perceived more legitimate royal line. After all, Illyrio does weirdly mention that only the male Blackfire line is extinct and he's aided by the Golden Company, Bittersteel's sellsword company. Illyrio also claims that the blood of Aegon flows in Daenerys. Of course, this was true of Viserys as well, who Illyrio does not respect and who he did not give eggs to. No, for some reason, Daenerys' blood is more true, more special. Perhaps Illyrio is talking about Daenerys' special genes and her ability to hatch dragon eggs and ride dragons. Whatever the case, it should be noted that if Danny is in fact a dragon seed from Dragonstone, she too would have the blood of Aegon the Conqueror. Tell me more of her. The fat man grew pensive. Daenerys was half a child when she came to me, yet fairer even than my second wife. So lovely I was tempted to claim her for myself. Such a fearful, furtive thing, however, I knew I should get no joy from coupling with her. Instead, I summoned a bedwarmer and fucked her vigorously until the madness passed. 
If truth be told, I did not think Daenerys would survive for long amongst the horse lords. So here we have a very, very odd tale. Illyrio claims that when he saw Danny for the first time, which was supposedly when she was 13, he wanted to have sex with her so much that he went half crazy, and so he vigorously had sex with a slave girl instead. Okay, very, very creepy, but also impossible as Illyrio is morbidly obese. He's not vigorously fucking anything. He can't even climb stairs without stopping to catch his breath. And here's the other thing. Daenerys is attractive, probably even very attractive, but she's not so attractive that people fall into madness. Men aren't tripping over each other in awe when they meet her. Keep in mind, A Game of Thrones opens with Viserys worrying that Danny isn't attractive enough. Yes, Jorah thinks Danny is very beautiful because she looks like his ex-wife, and she gets all sorts of compliments once she gains power, even legends made about her, but let's also remember how unimpressed Krasnys was with her, or how Hisdar on the one hand admitted that she was very desirable, while on the other hand articulated to her a rational plan for his marriage to her. Quentin Martell actually meets Daenerys, but when he longs for women, it's for Gwyneth Ironwood or the Drinkwater twins back in Dorne. No, men can certainly contain themselves around Daenerys. Again, hot is different from madness-inducing. So, as I said, Illyrio's story doesn't make too much sense. Still, it does add on to the notion that Illyrio cared very much for Danny's physical form. That is, her silver hair, her purple eyes, the clear evidence that she was the blood of old Valyria. He admits here in A Dance with Dragons that he finds Danny uncontrollably attractive, while defining attractive as very Valyrian in A Game of Thrones. He even claims that Danny is more attractive than his Valyrian-looking Lyseni wife Sarah, who was so attractive that he sacrificed his status in Pentos for her. Now, with Illyrio's story, we must also wonder if Illyrio met Daenerys prior to her staying at his manse perhaps when Illyrio was thinner and capable of having vigorous sex. Illyrio meeting Danny earlier is also supported by the fact that Illyrio admits that his plans with Daenerys went back years, and not just the six months that Viserys and Danny stayed with him. Another thing that is odd about Illyrio's story is that he claims that he thought Danny would die off in the Dothraki Sea. But if this were true, why would he expect the Dothraki to fight for Viserys or Aegon? The marriage was the entire bond to the Viserys cause, and he specifically tells both Varys and the Golden Company that the Dothraki were part of his plan. If Illyrio did believe that Danny would die, it would mean the Dothraki would be fundamentally unimportant to his plan, and he was only interested in something else, like maybe Danny's effect on the dragon eggs. That did not stop you from selling her to Khal Drogo. Dothraki neither buy nor sell, say rather that her brother Viserys gave her to Drogo to win the Cal's friendship, a vain young man, and greedy. Viserys lusted for his father's throne, but he lusted for Daenerys too, and was loath to give her up. The night before the princess wed, he tried to steal into her bed, insisting that if he couldn't have her hand, he would claim her maidenhead. Had I not taken the precaution of posting guards upon her door? Viserys might have undone years of planning. Now, this is another interesting passage that appears to contradict what's before it. Here, Illyrio claims that Viserys was greedy for lusting after his father's throne. But Viserys only wanted his birthright, the very thing that Illyrio is claiming he wants for Danny. How can one blame Viserys for wanting his birthright, but not blame Danny for it? This contradiction is only aggravated by the fact that Danny's birthright flows through Viserys' birthright. She was Viserys' heir. One can really only consider Viserys greedy if one thinks that the throne was not due to him and belonged to someone else, like maybe Aegon. Illyrio also seems to fault Viserys for wanting Danny, either sexually or matrimonially, which is odd as Illyrio himself claimed he lusted for her physically. Not to mention, in a feudal sense, Danny was in fact Viserys's to give away and make marriage arrangements for. He is king and lord over Danny. So, how is he greedy? The only way to square this contradiction is actually to believe that Viserys wasn't king and that Danny wasn't his kin. Of course, we don't really get much notion that Viserys desired Danny when he was alive. 
Again, he specifically said that she was too skinny and too young for his tastes. In fact, he even calls attraction to Danny queer and equates desiring a 13-year-old Daenerys with bestiality. And regarding his willingness to give up Danny, he famously tells Danny how disposable she is to him and how he would let the entire Kalasar rape her. The idea that Viserys didn't want to give up Danny is simply not supported by what we've seen. However, I suppose it's possible that Viserys did try to sleep with Danny. One could imagine a strategic reason for Viserys trying to put a bastard in Danny's belly. Danny's child would then never be able to claim Viserys' throne or be competition for him. He sounds an utter fool. Viserys was Mad Aerys' son, just so. Daenerys? Daenerys is quite different. He popped a roasted lark into his mouth and crunched it noisily, bones and all. The frightened child who sheltered in my manse died on the Dothraki Sea and was reborn in blood and fire. This dragon queen who wears her name is a true Targaryen. And so here Illyrio says that Danny is unlike Viserys. Viserys is Aerys' son, but Danny is a true Targaryen, with Illyrio invoking the supernatural events that occurred in the Dothraki Sea. That is, the hatching of the dragon eggs and Danny surviving the pyre. Of course, being a true Targaryen and not Aerys' daughter is supposed to be interpreted as metaphorical, at least on the first read. After all, Aerys and Viserys were bona fide Targaryens, and no one really denies that. But Danny is somehow truer than Aerys and Viserys, seemingly because of her abilities. Now, naturally, it's also very interesting to consider the statement as literal. That is, to accept that Danny is not Aerys' daughter, but truer because she comes from a different line. Regardless, it's very clear that Illyrio's stories are a convoluted mess filled with lies. And this is Tyrion's assessment as well. Illyrio finishes the conversation claiming his motive is to be master of coin, which Tyrion doesn't buy for a second. Still, even if Illyrio's tales are half-truths and lies, the broad subject matter still gives us an idea of what's on his mind. He begins by speaking of birthright and the blood of Aegon the Conqueror. Said a different way, this is a conversation of lineage and genetics. He then moves on to speak of the attractiveness of Danny to both himself and Viserys, attractiveness being defined as Valyrian looking for Illyrio. Again, lineage and genetics. The conversation then hints that his master plan may have gone back years and may have not really involved the Dothraki, before moving on to bashing Viserys, a man who's greedy for thinking he's owed his supposed birthright, and who is unworthy because he takes after his father, Ares. Again, a discussion of lineage and genetics. And then the passage ends with a declaration that Daenerys is a true Targaryen. Again, this is all one subject. Illyrio's real long plan, his interest in a living Daenerys, appears to be about her blood, her genes. That is, her genetic ability to hatch dragon eggs. And if this isn't convincing enough, Illyrio does do something interesting when Tyrion directly asks Illyrio his motive. What do you hope to gain from Queen Daenerys? The beggar king swore that I should be his master of coin, and a lordly lord as well. My manse is large enough for any man, and more comfortable than your drafty Westerosi castles. Master of coin, though, the fat man peeled another egg. I am fond of coins. Is there any sound as sweet as the clink of gold on gold? A sister screams. Are you certain that Daenerys will make good on her brother's promises? She will, or she will not. Illyrio bit the egg in half. I told you, my little friend, not all that a man does is done for gain. So in the middle of explaining his motives, Illyrio peels and consumes an egg. Perhaps a coincidence, but it does seem that our author is cluing us into Illyrio's true desire. And so if we go back to our question of what happened at the House with the Red Door, I would say that it appears Viserys was being groomed for rule with a man-at-arms, a septon, and a maester, much like Aegon was later on. Daenerys, a dragon seed from Dragonstone, was a tool for marriage alliances. I would guess that the Archon of Tyrosh set up their living arrangement, which would explain Daenerys' Tyrashi accent, and that they were on the cusp of securing an alliance with Dorne when Varys and Illyrio interfered. I suspect some poisonings occurred, Viserys fled with Danny, and the Viserys project fell apart. And in its place, the Aegon project was formed. But I would also say that Varys and Illyrio figured out Danny's genetic nature 
based on her appearance and wanted to use her when she eventually went through puberty. I think Illyrio's sexual excitement had less to do with Daenerys and more to do with the dragons. And so I believe Varys and Illyrio had Danny followed for years until she came of age. I would guess that they figured that if a pregnant Danny spent time with very valuable dragon eggs, she could hatch them. And if they did hatch, Jorah would be there to bring the hatchlings back to them to use in the Aegon cause. And if they didn't, well, no harm, no foul. Jorah would simply bring the eggs back. However, Viserys the Dothraki and ultimately Danny were all disposable. Not that the plan didn't have changes to it, it did seem they thought they could actually secure the Dothraki at one point, but fundamentally, I believe they wanted dragons for Aegon. And that's my analysis of the Page of Lies, the House with the Red Door, and Daenerys' true nature. I think I covered most mysteries, but forgive me if I missed something. Again, I have to say we have very little information to go on, so my confidence in everything is not that high, but something's definitely wrong with Daenerys' memory, and there's something up with that lemon tree. Once again, I'm probably wrong about half of this, and next time, because, well, frankly the entire world has been demanding it, I will be covering the most epic of all topics. Next time, we'll be talking about Brienne. And the Squishers. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.